Welcome to Declassifying the Paranormal. Here we reveal the secrets that sinister organizations attempt to conceal from the world, objects and entities that could shake the very foundations of what we think is, and is not, possible. Today we have secured documents belonging to the SCP Foundation, and will reveal to you the nature of SCP-6018. Content Warning Miscarriage and Birth-Related Trauma Item Number SCP-6018 Object Class Safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-6018 is to be contained in a secure item storage locker when not in use for testing. Personnel may request personal use of SCP-6018. Doing so requires permission from 25 different staff members, at least 5 of which must never have clearance level 36018 or higher. Tests may no longer be conducted with pregnant women in the effective range of SCP-6018 without clearance from a member of the O5 Council. These tests may only be conducted with vetted Foundation personnel with clearance level 46018 or higher as the test subject. Description SCP-6018 is a cassette player with a cassette tape inside, containing the song Born This Way by Lady Gaga. To date, all attempts to disassemble SCP-6018 and examine its inner workings have been unsuccessful. SCP-6018 displays its anomalous properties when being played in its entirety and rewound to the beginning of the tape by a single individual. When operated in this manner, SCP-6018 will transfer the consciousness of the individual who played and rewound it into a new, living body. SCP-6018 will always select the youngest living human within 100 meters as the target vessel. The vessel that the user leaves enters a comatose state and dies, if left unattended. No evidence of the previous consciousness of the target vessel has yet been observed, and at this time the consciousnesses lost this way are presumed dead. SCP-6018-1 is an extra-dimensional anomaly that can be accessed by utilizing SCP-6018 in the vicinity of a pregnant woman. Addendum 6018-1 On September 13, 2014, a 60-year-old Foundation staff member named Dr. Neptune volunteered for Experiment 6018-37. In this experiment the test subject was to have their consciousness transferred to the unborn child of a pregnant D-class. Years after this experiment succeeded, the following interviews were conducted. They occurred on April 1, 2017, soon after Dr. Neptune regained the ability to speak. As a result of his testimony, the secure containment procedures were updated on June 1, 2017 to restrict further testing on pregnant women. Interview Log 6018-A Begin Audio Log Interviewer, Junior Researcher Fleming Interviewee, Dr. Neptune So I understand that you have recently regained the ability to speak. Congratulations, Dr. Neptune. I imagine these past few years have been frustrating for you. Yes, although I unfortunately still have a lisp, and yes, you have no idea how frustrating it is being a baby again, but I would rather not dwell on that at the moment. Note, for the sake of clarity, Dr. Neptune's lisp will be ignored for the remainder of the transcription. Words impacted by the lisp will be written as normal. Right, I can scarcely imagine that situation. As I understand it, you requested this interview because you had something vital to share about your experiences, is that correct? Yes, you see when I had finished using SCP-6018 and vacated my previous body, I lost consciousness. Isn't it normal to be unconscious while one is developing in their mother's womb? I presume so, but it did not feel like I was falling unconscious. Instead, it felt as if I was waking up somewhere else. Somewhere else? What was it like? Silence ensues for approximately 16 seconds as Dr. Neptune collects his thoughts. When I first awoke, I was at the end of a long line of people, similar to what you would find at an amusement park, except everyone was facing towards me, and they were not exactly people. In the traditional sense of the word at least. 
Could you elaborate? Yes, I intend to. Be patient, kid. As I was saying, they were not really people, but they somewhat were. I suppose you could call them souls for simplicity. That is what I thought of them as while I was there. They have human heads with their facial features in seemingly random placements on them, usually nowhere close to making a normal human face. They also all had between two to four limbs attached at random locations on their head. These limbs varied between all sorts of animals, from human limbs to crab claws, to lion tails. They moved in strange and unique ways, befitting their unique anatomies. Were you in a similar form? Oddly enough, no. I was in a form very similar to my former body, yet smaller. I was about the size of a child. If these souls, as I will refer to them, had accurate adult human proportions, then I believe I was about one meter tall, but that is of little importance. As I said before, I was at the end of a long queue of sorts, with everyone facing me. Naturally, I turned around to see what they were all facing, and it was a large doorway filled with a solid, white glow. It was so opaque that I could not see anything past it. Once I took in the sight, I got out of the line so that the others could pass by. Sure enough, as soon as I left, the line started moving, with each soul walking uniformly into the light. It was only then I realized that this was a large gate with the soul creatures exiting out the other side. After observing this for a few more minutes, I confirmed that nothing of particular interest was happening to these creatures inside the gate, nothing that I could observe at least. Weeks later, I tried to pass through the gate, but I found myself unable to move through the light like the others had. After I took that in and got over my initial shock, I began to explore the area. I found that it seemed to go on forever, as if looking across large empty plains. There was nothing large in the distance to impede my view, and it seemed to extend forever. The sky and ground, however, were unnatural. They were both uniform, without any patterns or blemishes to speak of, and entirely baby blue in color. Were there any notable features besides these souls and the line to the gate? Yes, there were plenty of strange objects at random locations to break up the otherwise monotonous world. I found plenty of tables with strange chairs that the soul creatures would sit at for long periods of time. End audio log After this point in the interview Dr. Neptune began to mumble, repeat himself, and become visibly drowsy, according to junior researcher Fleming. Within 10 minutes, the caretaker in charge of Dr. Neptune collected him for his regularly scheduled nap time. The interview resumes two hours later. Interview Log 6018-B Begin Audio Log Interviewer, Junior Researcher Fleming Interviewee, Dr. Neptune Hello again, Dr. Neptune. How was your nap? Dr. Neptune responds with an aggressive tone. It served its purpose. Now, where were we? I believe we were discussing the other features of the world you were inhabiting. Ah, yes. As I was saying, the souls were seated at tables around the space for long stretches, from hours to what felt like days. What were they doing there? They were engaged in various games. Backgammon, card games, dice games, and plenty more that I still do not recognize. They were also betting strange tokens on these games, even when they were not participating in the games themselves. What were these tokens like? They were simple coin-shaped tokens, they were marked with an uncountable number of symbols. There were numbers, letters, constellations, planets, animals, and many more depictions that were unfamiliar to me. Regardless, I later found that these tokens were all of equal value, even those with numbered markings. Did the iconography seem connected across coins at least? 
not that I could tell. I believe that many of the tokens depicted images outside of human language and history. I never saw two tokens that were exactly alike. Interesting. And you said they were gambling with them. How could you tell? They were not using language if that is what you are asking. It seemed instinctual for them. They would simply walk up to a table, expel a number of tokens from their mouth or similar orifice, and place them on the table for ante. Whoever won took every token bet by the players for that game. Everyone else betting on the game made brief gestures amongst themselves and traded tokens with each other after the outcome. Did you recognize the type of sign language they used? No, it was not quite sign language. There was no consistency to these gestures between individuals. At first I thought I was missing something, but then one of them spoke to me after I spent a few hours observing one of the tables. Spoke you say? Not speaking in the traditional sense. The creature gesticulated towards me after it approached, and, shortly after it finished, I subconsciously understood what it was trying to convey. Did it communicate using telepathy? No, telepathy implies interfacing from mind to mind. This felt much more like what they were trying to communicate was being translated for me in my mind. It felt like the world itself was translating this creature for me. After this experience and a little practice, I was able to understand any creature in this realm if I focused on them while they were gesturing. You were able to communicate with them then? To some degree, yes. While I could speak to these creatures, they did not necessarily understand what I was saying. They did not seem to have advanced enough intellects to do anything besides communicate about gambling. The most evidence of intelligence I ever witnessed in that world was object permanence. Interesting. If you were able to understand them, then were you eventually able to make sense of the coins? I already told you that was not the case. The images on the tokens appeared to be superfluous. There was no real meaning in them besides decoration. Then did the tokens themselves have a purpose? Yes, I was getting there. There were more than just tables in this space. There were also strange devices akin to vending machines. Vending machines? Is that how you and these creatures subsisted? What? No, there was no need to eat, drink, or do anything else for survival there. Then what were the vending machines for? They dispensed pieces of paper similar to receipts that changed in quality depending how many tokens you put in the machine. Quality you say? Yes, each machine was labeled in a strange language. The labels said things like wealth, family, personality, fame, skills, death, and plenty more such categories. And what was the purpose of these receipts? I am not entirely certain. All I know for sure is that creatures would exchange tokens for them and eat them. Usually, this would only occur once a creature had stopped playing at tables, and, after exchanging all of their tokens for receipts, they would enter the queue to the gate. The one that you were next to when you first entered SCP-6018-1? The very same, yes. I see, and how did you leave that place? I did not leave. I tried to on several occasions. I attempted traveling through the gate multiple times, from both directions. I tried walking in one direction for long stretches of time, but to no avail. One day, I just felt my body slowly disappear, and, eventually, I realized I had become a baby again. After that, I patiently waited until I could act at least somewhat autonomously, and, well, here we are. I see. Is there anything else you want to say before we conclude the interview? Yes. I must admit. I still understand very little about that world, 
yet I cannot help but feel it is very important. I highly recommend that the Foundation continue to research it extensively. End audio log. Addendum 6018-2 On January 16, 2017, Operation Mimir officially began, and 12 separate agents were sent into SCP-6018-1 for further investigations. Of the 12 agents who were sent, only 6 returned. The other agents were lost to pregnancy complications. On February 18, 2019, interviews about the agents' experiences began to be conducted. Because of their testimonies, Dr. Neptune's descriptions of his discoveries were verified. According to the agents, the receipts that Dr. Neptune described in his interviews were obtained and ingested by half of the field agents in the operation. Each of the agents who did so is as follows. Display data. Agent name SCP-6018-1 Activity Additional Notes. Agent Bravo Seymour Reynolds Agent Bravo exchanged 35 tokens at a device labeled Regrets. The text on the receipt read as follows, You will lose the one true love of your life to one bad night. This voucher can be redeemed for 165 tokens. Agent Bravo stored the receipt by consuming it, as other residents of SCP-6018-1 did, but was unable to redeem it for tokens. Agent Bravo began gagging and coughing soon after and continued to do so for several hours. Agent Bravo reported having no regrets of any kind in his previous life to the other agents upon receiving his receipt. Agent Bravo's new vessel was stillborn, preventing him from testifying on his own behalf. Agent Charlie James Everdeen Agent Charlie attempted to insert 300 tokens at a device labeled Death. However, he only succeeded in exchanging 200 tokens before receiving a receipt with the following text. You will die at the age of 52. Agent Charlie was reluctant to consume the receipt but did so after being ordered to by Agent Alpha. Later in the operation, Agent Charlie was caught removing the receipt from his person and disposing of it. After being caught, Agent Charlie refused to consume the receipt again. This aversion may have been related to Agent Charlie being 54 years old before joining Operation Mimir. Agent Charlie was lost to a miscarriage before he could return from SCP-6018-1. Agent Echo, Sylvia Ruiz Agent Echo exchanged one token at a device labeled Family. The resulting receipt said, You will be the oldest child in a family of 20 and be expected to care for your younger siblings. Agent Echo consumed the receipt, as ordered, but had considerable difficulty swallowing it. It took her several hours to complete the task. Notably, Agent Echo was an only child in her previous life. Agent Echo died in a containment breach while her new vessel's mother was still pregnant with her. The mother in question survived. Agent Foxtrot, Dominique de Rose, Agent Foxtrot exchanged 200 tokens at a device labeled Skills. The receipt from said exchange read as follows. You will be blessed with great athletic capabilities with a particular aptitude for marksmanship. Agent Foxtrot swallowed the receipt without any significant difficulties or adverse side effects. Agent Foxtrot was an MTF agent during her time at the Foundation who regularly scored highly on marksmanship exercises. Agent Juliet, Mohammed Faraj Agent Juliet exchanged 50 tokens at the device labeled Personality. He received a receipt with the following text. You will be a mildly introverted soul with a cold exterior. Agent Juliet consumed the receipt, despite finding it incredibly hot to the touch. This phenomenon was not reported when other Foundation agents examined the receipt. After consuming the receipt, Agent Juliet reported feeling mildly feverish, which continued for the remainder of his time in SCP-6018-1. It should be noted that Agent Juliet was extroverted and popular among his peers during his time at the Foundation. Agent Juliet died when his new vessel's mother had to undergo surgery during childbirth. Agent Kilo, Pyrone Green Agent Kilo, exchanged 20 tokens at a device labeled Wealth and received a receipt labeled with the following text. 
You will have an average income of $25,000 throughout your career and be unable to retire. Agent Kilo consumed the receipt without issue but began to glow green and experience nausea after an hour had passed. These symptoms were present for the remainder of his stay within SCP-6018-1. According to Foundation records, Agent Kilo had a considerably higher salary while employed with the Foundation for the last 30 years. Additional findings Despite the adverse side effects Foundation agents received when consuming the receipts, no such reaction was reported in any resident of SCP-6018-1. Residents of SCP-6018-1 tended to disappear in a similar manner as Foundation staff did upon leaving SCP-6018-1. This event always coincided with the resident in question watching gambling games for several consecutive days without betting. Of the Foundation staff who returned, some reported side effects. Agent Hotel was born deaf in his left ear, which was also the case in his previous life. Foundation researchers have yet to discover a plausible medical explanation for this. The genetics of Agent Hotel's new vessel had no notable predisposition to this and no major incident occurred to Agent Hotel while his new vessel was developing. Agent Kilo was also born with a new birth defect, arrhythmia due to a congenital defect, which he did not have in his previous life. Because of this, he died four months after being born again and the remaining payments promised to him were transferred to living relatives. Signs of this birth defect did not appear until shortly before Agent Kilo was born into his new vessel. Agent Foxtrot was also born with a minor birth defect, a cleft palate. Similar to Agent Kilo, there was no sign of this birth defect in her previous life or in her prenatal development. Addendum 6018-3 On February 20, 2020, Phase 2 of Operation Mimir was launched. Over the course of six months, SCP-6018 was utilized to send 200 Foundation agents to SCP-6018-1 in order to attempt to contain it. Results are pending. As of June 23, 2021, only three Foundation agents sent by Phase 2 have successfully returned from SCP-6018-1. Phase 3 of Operation Mimir is in the process of being organized while we await the testimonies of the surviving agents. If you have recommendations for participants in or wish to volunteer for Operation Mimir, then please contact Dr. Neptune. Currently. Only 12 of the 200 agents required to assert control over SCP-6018-1 have been recruited. Security clearance requirements have been temporarily reduced in order to meet the recruitment quota. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did please subscribe, like and share it around. If you have any particular case files you'd like us to cover in future broadcasts, leave a comment below and we'll get around to it shortly. Tune in again tomorrow for more revelations.